Hello everyone, my name is Kave Cardan, coming to you from the beautiful state of Hawaii. And I'm going to be running you through some common Lisp code. And um, hopefully you will find this interesting and informative. So the first thing we're going to do is launch uh, Slime. For those of you who want to follow along um, on the website, on the GitHub site, I have uh, put in all the source code and the instructions on how to download CCL and get your Emacs and Slime running if you want to follow along. Otherwise, you can just sit back, relax, perhaps with a beverage, and enjoy the common list tutorials that we'll be walking through. So um, this tutorial and this series of tutorials assumes that you have some working knowledge of programming. Uh, and this is to introduce you to common list as a language not introduce you to programming as a uh, application domain. So I'm going to assume that you know what a class is, what a method is, what variables are, and you know things of that sort. So the first file we have here is called lesson01.lisp and I'm just going to basically um, select the buffer and run it and that will launch some uh, startup code behind the scenes. So we're letting that go. So to reiterate, I'm using Closure Common Lisp on Mac OS, and we'll be using OpenGL for our graphics. And the thrust of this uh, um, tutorial is basically 2D graphics. I'm not going to need this guy. We'll close down. All right. So we start by running. The function run, which basically opens up our little graphics window. So let me start by walking you through some of the code. Um, I've kept this as simple as I can. It's, I'm not using any um, def system or any ASDF or build system. For those of you who already know Common Lisp, I have very little in the way of dependencies. The only dependencies we have are literally just Coco because we're running on the Mac and OpenGL because that's what we're using for our graphics. So I'm going to kind of skim over some of the code here, not really going to get into detail of how the graphics code is working, how the OpenGL stuff is set up. Um, we have a class called SceneView, which we basically inherit from the next step, NS OpenGL view. That's what we have here on the right-hand side, the little black window. And then we define, it contains a pointer to a scene. A scene is where we're going to be keeping our data. We'll see more about that later. And the draw method, which is what um, Mac OS requires, clears the color to black, sets that to sets the color buffer um, bit. And then basically, if there is a scene, it just draws a scene and then flushes the graphics buffer pipeline so that uh, we get our image. A couple of helper methods, which again, we're not going to get into much. Um, just accept the first mouse click, so when we click on it, things happen. And um, basically, if we click on the window, it'll refresh itself, but we hopefully won't need to do too much of that because we have code for doing that. And then we basically um, set up our window here. We set up a 512 by 512 window and return it. A little bit of Stuff we have to do to make sure that stuff works is to make sure that we're doing everything on the main thread because that's what uh, OpenGL expects, or the Mac UI, I should say, expects. So now we're going to start defining, defining our own code, so to speak. And the first thing we're going to define is a class called Shape. It has no superclasses. It has no member, no slots. Slots are what Common Lisp calls um, attributes or fields in other languages. And it has a draw method, which doesn't do anything. Basically, when we subclass this shape, then that will be doing our draw methods for us. Um, okay, our scene class contains a list of shapes. So the way this works is when you have a slot, you have various number of keywords you can give to it. So basically, it's called shapes. It will create an accessor function for it, which I'm also calling shapes. And then that's if you want to give it an initialization argument when you create it. And the init form is the default value, which is the empty list. So 
we define a couple of helper methods for ourselves. So add shape basically um, pushes a given shape onto the list of shapes, and that's a destructive operation, so they'll modify the actual shapes list. And then for convenience, returns the shape if you want to do stuff to it afterwards. Clear shapes simply sets the shapes of the scene to be the empty list again. And then to draw the shapes, draw the scene, I should say, we basically simply go through the list of shapes of the scene and then draw each one of them. So um, if you're familiar with you know, other object-oriented languages or object-oriented programming in other languages, you know, the syntax here may not be familiar, but you don't have to worry too much about that. You can just kind of get the gist of what we're doing. It should be pretty straightforward. Uh, list code is actually reasonably straightforward to understand and read in most cases. Um, I know people get freaked out by the parentheses, but that's pretty much the only syntactic thing we have with some colons and hash signs and so on. We don't have square brackets and curly brackets and semicolons and that sort of thing. Well, we have semicolons, but they're for comments. So, to set things up, we create a global parameter, global variable called scene, which is the make, make instance of scene. And we create a window as well. And when we call it the function run, which I did earlier, it binds the window to the result of show window, which returns the window. And then we define one function called redraw, which sets the needs display flag of the content view of the window to be true. Now this little syntactic stuff here is basically calling foreign functions. So these are objective C functions that are being called from Lisp. So we already called the run method and that's why we have this black window here. So a few utilities, um, random number generation, I'm not going to get into that too much. Utilities to concatenate strings and symbols, again, not, not important right now. Let's jump into our graphics code. And we're going to be doing 2D graphics. So the first thing we need to represent is 2D points. So we define a class point. It has no superclasses. And it contains an x and a y variable initialized to 0. Now, for the more experienced common list programmers who might be following this, um, obviously in a production system, if you to represent your 2D points, you would not use classes. That's probably too much overhead. You'd use something simpler like a type def or an array. But this is for pedagogical reasons, for teaching reasons. Uh, I'm keeping things very clean and simple, and the whole point is to introduce things like classes to us. So we do a couple of little things here. Whenever we set the x value of a point, we make sure that we coerce the value to a single float. Coerce is basically a common list way of doing a cast between types. And that's because we're going to be passing these x and y values to OpenGL and if they're not a type single float, then OpenGL complains. If they're integers, it doesn't like them, and, and so on. So we have these two functions here. Again, the exact details of what is going on is less important than understanding that all they're doing is basically, um, whenever we set the y value, it sets the internal slot value of y to be the single float coercion of the value. Here we have a constructor. Um, or just a function basically that creates a point uh, out of two quote values x and y. And I've, I've selected a very short function name p bang uh, p exclamation mark um, for doing that. And then we have our first method on points, which is basically to, to add two points together. So we have p1 and p2, and we create a new point. We don't destructively modify any points. The lispy way of doing things is to always return new values if possible. So just add the x values, add the y values, make a new point out of that, and that's it. So if we do that, so then I'm going to go here and hit Control-C, Control-C to evaluate that. And I go into my listener. So now if we have P, it's a point. And I can do things like look up the type of P. OK, it's not echoing in here, but. So it's a point. The class of P, which is not type, type is, is the name. The class of P is a pointer to the actual class that I represent, the standard class point. 
In common list with the common list object system, C loss, classes are objects as well. And we're probably not going to get into that in these tutorials. It's a little bit of an advanced uh, subject, but you can actually customize the way classes behave, and that's called the meta object protocol. But we're probably not going to be getting into that. And whenever you have a symbol or something, you can basically um, describe it, and that kind of gives you information about it, what the class is, and what the instance slots are, and so forth. Now, we notice that, um, actually one other thing we can do, which is very useful, is to basically um, inspect our class. And the window pops up behind the Emacs buffer, so I'm just going to pop it up here. So this is an inspector. Um, it gives the same information, more or less, that the uh, uh, describe method gave us, but it actually is interactive, and we can you know, click on things and see values and so on. So for example, um, it's not, no, I'm going to jump out of this for now, but we'll get into it a little bit later. Now, notice when we type P to get our point, it echoes um, this thing, which is basically, you know, the type and then a pointer value. So it's not very useful when we're looking at points. We want to see what the actual coordinates are. So we're going to, so the common object system lets you define a method called print object, which basically show, tells you how, you know, how you can, um, excuse me, it basically lets you customize how the object is represented in a printed format. So if I do this variation here, and I hit P, it's just returning in square brackets, format is basically Lisp's version of printf. So in square brackets, it's returning the x of the cell from the y of the cell. And that's fine, uh, but we can also print out some more information. Uh, if we print out the type and the identity of it as well, compile that, p, then we get the type as well as the coordinates that we put in there and the identity, which is basically the pointer to it. But that's maybe a little bit too much. And if we're going to be looking at large lists of points and things like that, we don't really care what the address necessarily is. So I'm going to define this third variation where the identity flag is not included, so it's nil, it's turn, turned off. And now if we look at P, it just tells us what the type is and what the coordinates are. And that's what we'll use for our uh, code going forward, just as a utility. So the first actual shape that we're going to define is a polygonal shape class, which inherits from shape. So the superclass is shape. It's a polygonal shape class. It contains a list of points that start off as being the empty point, and it contains a flag called is closed shape, in case we want to have shapes that are closed, or polygons that are closed or not. And I put a question mark at the end to indicate that it's a Boolean and should only take true or false values. And the default value is true, so by default, our polygons are going to be closed. Uh, the convention in common lisp is traditionally to put a p for predicate at the end of it. So this thing would be is close shape dash p. But I like the scheme approach of putting question marks for Boolean, so I'm going to be doing that in these lessons. We define a couple of methods for our polygon shape. The first one is to add a point to it. Again, it pushes a point p onto the list of points of the polygon shape, kind of the same way that when we added the shape to the scene, we pushed it onto the uh, list. So this basically adds it to the beginning of the list, the first element of the list. Then we have our draw method where we actually make some OpenGL calls to draw the polygon shapes. And we, again, like we saw with uh, previously when we were doing Objective-C calls, these are OpenGL calls, so these are C language calls. So it's a hash underscore and then the function, and you give it the numbers. So we set the color to be white, line width to be three, and if it's a closed shape, we do we create a line loop so it closes the last point. Otherwise, it's a line strip so it'll remain open. And then do list is for iterating over lists. So for each point p in the points of the shape, we call the gl vertex 3f and give it x, y, and zero since we're dealing in 2D coordinates only. We're not we're always going to put a zero for the z coordinate. And this is why we need the coarse 
float, single float, because that's what the 3F version of GL vertex 3 requires. And then GL end closes the shape. So let's start by making a shape. So we're going to have, create a function with define, make square shape, takes one parameter length, let the V be half the length, and then we make an instance of polygon shape, and this is where we had the init arg for the point. So we give it a points are going to be a list of four points, basically the four points of a square. So if we give it a one, V will be 0 0.5, we 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5, Minus 0.5, minus 0.5, minus 0.5, 0.5. So if you've done graphics, this should be very straightforward for you. Um, so let's uh, see what happens now. So we're going to make the shape, compile this, SQ. Normally, when you do global variables by convention, you put um, stars before and after them. Global variable, variables are actually kind of special. They're dynamically scoped. Uh, we may or may not get into that in these tutorials. But um, by convention, we always put uh, stars before and after so we know something is a global variable. So now we're going to add the square to the scene. So prog n is like a block format. So it executes everything that comes after it and returns the last thing. So when I evaluate this whole expression here, um, it's going to add the shape to the scene, the square shape, and then it'll call the redraw function that refreshes our window. So if I do that now, presto, we have our first graphics, which is a white square. Um, and the coordinate systems of the window are from minus 1 to 0 0.1. So this is from minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5. And now we can basically inspect that square. Like we showed earlier, I have to just make sure I pop it in the front. So this is our square shape. Um, close shape flag is true. It has points. The points are cons, which is Lisp's way of telling you it's a list of four, length four, and each of the points is here with its coordinate. Now notice that the format in which it's representing the points is the same format that we put in our print object method. So that's part of the standard object system. And therefore, the rest of the system, the environment, picks it up and uses it. So that's different from just writing a print function in C or something like that and then having to call it yourself. But the internals of the development environment aren't aware of that print function as being special or used to represent your class. So, and then the point has an X and a Y of 0.5. Now, we're going to try a couple of things here. We're going to make the shape open. So we set the is closed shape to be nil, and then we call redraw. So now we can see the top line is gone because it's an open shape. And the interesting thing is basically, if I now look at um, my shape, closed shape was true, but if I refresh it, closed shape is nil. So this contains basically up updates and uh, provides you with a you know up-to-date view of what your data structures are doing which is very useful and then finally um, let's add a point to our square using the add point method so we're going to add a point at the origin and then we haven't done a redraw yet so it hasn't refreshed it so one option we have is to basically click in the window because that does a redraw so we click in the window and does a redraw for us. And this is the fifth point of the object now that has been added. Now, let's note, whenever we notice patterns, we have, we have places where we can optimize our workflow. So we are often doing something and then calling redraw, and then doing something and then calling redraw. So let's wrap this up in a macro so that we can just execute code and have the redraw be done for us afterwards. I'm going to skip over a little bit of the complete details of macros. They're pretty advanced, but one of the features of one of the defining features of Lisp, which everybody will tell you at some point or the other, is that you know you can do amazing macros in Lisp. Um, so the idea of macros is basically they generate code that then gets evaluated 
And since the Lisp code are con consists of Lisp expressions, which are lists, basically what your Lisp macro is doing is creating a list that get, is then code and gets expressed, sorry, um, evaluated. So this is the naive way of trying to do a with redraw. A body takes everything else and puts it in a list. And so this puts it in the prog end block. So it, it unfurls all the elements of the list body and then calls a redraw. But that's actually incorrect because what prog end does is always returns the value of the last element in its list, in its body. So it's actually going to return the value of redraw but well, we actually want to return the value of body. So what we do is, with a newer version of the macro, we create a temporary variable called result and put the body execution in there. And then we have the, whatever the prog end was going to return, or whatever the body returns, we have in result. Then we call redraw, then we return the result. So, if I close the shape now, because it was open, inside of a with redraw method, with redraw macro, excuse me, it automatically updates, as you saw, without me having to explicitly call a redraw. So we can actually look at this. So macro expand will take the expression that I give it, and when you put a quote in front of an expression in list that says don't evaluate it, just return it as a list. Because the macro expand wants to take that list and then operate on it as a macro does and it'll return a new list. And then we will pretty print that so with a little bit of formatting so we can see what it's doing. So down here we see the result of it. So it's when we execute with redraw setup is close shape square true, it creates let result be prog n of setup is close shape square true, which is our body then calls redraw, then returns a result. So if you look at this, you can see how the structure of it is here as a template, basically. And then it fills in the appropriate arguments, such as body, in this case. And then we can clear the scene. So if I just hit a clear shapes with redraw, the scene has been cleared. So nothing in our window. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about operating on lists. Lisp is obviously stands for list processing. And although back in the day, in the early days when it was first invented, the list was pretty much the prime data structure, the language itself has evolved over decades. So it has all kinds of other data structures as well, everything from you know arrays to uh, hash maps to classes and types and structures and all these things. But lists are still an important aspect of, common, of, of Lisp. And um, being able to operate on them is, is quite useful and a handy thing to know how to do. You actually have to kind of know how to do it. So I'm going to introduce the map car function. So what it does is basically it maps over a list. So other, fun other languages like Python and Java, I'm assuming, have things of that sort, where you can map over a list with a function. So map car takes a function and a list and then basically applies that function to every element in the list and then returns a the resulting list. So just to give you a quick idea of what this does. Let me go to the bottom there. I was popping up a little bit. So, so it returns 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, which is kind of obvious when you look at it. You can kind of figure out what's happening. Lambda is an unnamed function. Um, creates a closure and the number sign quote tells it that this is a function and should be evaluated, evaluated as a function. Lisp has a dual namespace, has different namespaces for functions and for variables and therefore you need this number sign quote to tell it when it's supposed to be evaluated as a function. So it's a function of one argument x and it returns x times 2 doubles the value. And then this one is simply a list of five elements. Again, the quote in front says, don't try to evaluate this because you know a list can be evaluated as common list code, but we don't have a function called one applied to arguments two, three, four, five. We just want the data in there. 
And then you can also apply simple like um, built-in functions to it. So for example, map car odd p returns true if the value is odd and false if the value is even. So if we apply that, we can see that it goes, you know, t nil, t nil, t, which is what's to be expected. So I told you about map card because we're going to use it here. Um, we're basically going to randomize the points of a shape given some delta that's a point. So um, what we do is basically we do a map car of a function over all the points of the shape and the map car returns a new list and then we set the points of the shape to be that new list. So if we look at what the function does, it takes a point as argument, which is one of the points of list of the points of the shape one by one. And then creates a temporary variable called offset. And offset is a point, new point, which is a random value of the x of delta and the y of delta. So it's basically creating a, a point and what rand1 did was creates a value between minus a and plus a. So this is giving you a random number between minus x of delta and plus x of delta. Same thing with y. And then we add that offset to the point. So that offsets the point and gives us a new point. And the, the, those new points get accumulated into a list that map car returns and then we set those into our shape. So if I add the um, our square, or what used to be a square, is now kind of a weird shape, um, to our scene, it pops up in the window because we're using it with Retro Macro. Now, if we do randomized points, say by point one in each direction, so it's going to randomize the, the values of our coordinates by minus point one to plus point one in x and y. And it's inside a with redraw method, so it'll get updated. So you can see what's happening. And if I evaluate it again, it'll get applied again, and again, and again, and again. So each time it's taking random numbers and adding them to the coordinates, and it's distorting the shapes. Now, let's try a couple of other things um, before we call it for our first lesson. So. With redraw, clear shapes. So we're going to remove everything in the scene. And we're going to iterate over a list with a variable size over this list of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1, which are sizes. And we're going to add to the scene a square shape of that size. So we basically have four squares that we added to the scene of different sizes, we can see them here. And now what we can do is basically use our randomize points function and um, iterate over all the shapes in the scene and modify them by some small amount. So as I evaluate the expression, you can see all the points are being displaced and I can do it again and again and again and again and again. Um, and we have uh, now concluded our very first Lisp lesson. Hopefully it wasn't too painful. It might have been even slightly enjoyable. And um, yes, if you'd like to see the code, please go to the GitHub. I'll put all the information in the comments for the video. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you.